thank you so much for coming. My name is Erwin Chemerinsky. I'm Dean of the Law School at UC Berkeley. And I have the enormous privilege of being the president of the Association of American Law Schools this year. We're here for a very special occasion. Today, we'll honor excellence in leadership, in legal education, and celebrate the many accomplishments of school faculty over the last year. Every LLS president has the ability to pick a theme for the year. I decided the theme for my year for this annual conference is how law schools can make a difference. The award winners that we'll be celebrating today are truly people who are making a difference through their research, their advocacy, their teaching, and their actions. In the spirit of honoring excellence in legal education, I'd like to introduce my colleague and the chair of the LLS Committee to review scholarly papers, Andrew Guzman, Dean of the University of Southern California Gould School of Law, who will present the awards from the scholarly papers competition. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, thank you, Erwin. To encourage and recognize legal scholarship and broaden participation by new faculty in the AALS, the association conducts a scholarly papers competition for full-time faculty who have taught from five year, four or five years or less. Now in its 37th year, scholars recognized by this competition have gone on to serve as a best-selling author, uh, been elected to the House of Representatives, and, and, and unfortunately, even as law dean, I don't know why they would do that. Uh, we had 88 submissions this year to the competition from 67 different uh, AALS schools. A blind process was used to review the papers with authors and school affiliations removed. I want to first thank my colleagues on the committee, um, Martin Belsky from the University of Akron School of Law, Talia Gillis from Columbia Law School, Sarah Lasky from Northwestern U University Pritzker School of Law, and Troy McKenzie from NYU School of Law. Oh, I'm sorry, and Sydney Watson from St. Louis University School of Law. It was great to work with all of you, and I want to say uh, it's, it's, it's so enjoyable working with a committee when you can have a serious discussion over the quality of papers in a collegial and congenial way where everybody's uh, listening to each other, and that was a feature of this committee, so thank you to all of you. Uh, the first uh, person in paper I want to recognize uh, is the author whose paper earned an honorable mention for the competition. The paper is Measuring Clarity in Legal Text by Jonathan Choi of the University of Minnesota Law School. So thank you to Andrew and the committee. I'm excited to receive this honorable mention and especially to receive it in person with all of you here today. And congratulations to Professor Summers for her very well-deserved award. Uh, to briefly summarize my paper, I use computer-based natural language processing methods to study legal text. I use these methods to measure how clear or unclear language is in statutes, contracts, and other legal texts at issue in real-world cases. What I find is evidence of widespread textual indeterminacy, which undermines claims that text is usually clear and that cases can be decided on the basis of text alone. I also find evidence that textual meaning is highly dependent upon setting, again, undermining the idea that text is a consistent basis on which to decide cases. The paper brings innovations from the computer science literature to the study of jurisprudence. Given how quickly these natural language processing algorithms are developing, I hope to set the groundwork for more interactions between law and computer science and future work by myself and others. Uh, so thank you again to the committee for choosing me for this honor, and thank you to the community of supportive scholars of legislation and scholars of computational analysis of law whose feedback made this work so much better. And finally, thank you to my colleagues on the faculty at Minnesota Law and to Dean Gary Jenkins for their consistent advice and support. Congratulations again, Jonathan. And now I'm pleased to announce this year's winner. Uh, it is for an article entitled Civil Probation by Nicole Summer by Nicole Summers at the Georgetown University Law Center. Thank you.
very much, Dean Guzman, Dean Chemerinsky, and to the entire selection committee. It is such an honor to receive this award and to be recognized alongside Jonathan Choi. The inspiration for this paper grew out of my time in practice as an eviction defense attorney, first at legal aid organizations and then as a clinical instructor at two legal services clinics at Harvard Law School. As a clinical teacher, I supervise students in the representation of tenants facing eviction in the Boston Housing Court. As many of us in the room know, in places like Boston, more than 90% of tenants face eviction without legal representation, and almost 90% of landlords in the cases have representation. The idea for this paper first came to me in 2019 while representing a client who was facing eviction from subsidized housing. The stated ground for eviction was that she had her adult son living with her without the landlord's permission in violation of her lease. This would have been a hard case in any circumstance, but what made it particularly challenging was that the eviction was not brought under the normal rules. Instead, what had happened was that almost a decade earlier, our client had faced eviction for non-payment of rent. She came to court without a lawyer and signed a settlement agreement that said she would pay back the rent she owed over a period of time. But what the settlement also did, through legalese carefully crafted by the landlord's attorney, was that it subjected our client to an alternative legal regime during the entire time the settlement was in place. It said that during the settlement period, if the landlord alleged that our client violated any term of the lease, however unrelated to that initial payment of rent, non-payment of rent, the landlord could simply file a motion for eviction. Pursuant to the structure of the agreement, this motion would be adjudicated under an entirely different set of rules than if it were a standard eviction complaint. Virtually none of the substantive or procedural rules enacted by the legislature to protect tenants in eviction proceedings would apply. And that's exactly what the landlord did. Based on this case, I set out to understand empirically how common this sort of settlement agreement was. I collected and coded about 1,000 eviction case files from the Boston Housing Court. And what I found is that it is, it is in fact quite common. It's the most common outcome of an eviction filing there. I argue based on my data findings that this type of agreement represents what I call civil probation. Analogous to criminal probation, it requires tenants to abide by certain conditions and provides that if they violate any of those conditions, they can be evicted through an alternative, far less protective legal process. This legal process all but guarantees landlords a swift eviction for any violation. I argue in the paper that the system of civil probation creates a shadow legal system, enhances landlord control, and stands to create a more expansive eviction legal system overall. There are so many people I want to thank for supporting me in this project. First, my former colleagues and mentors at the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau for supporting me while I began the research. The American Bar Foundation and the JPB Foundation generously provided funding for the project, for which I'm immensely grateful. My current colleagues at Georgetown have been endlessly supportive and have pushed me to think about the concept of civil probation in new ways. And finally, there are several mentors, colleagues, and friends I want to especially thank. When I started writing the paper, I had a very small network in the academy, and while a few of those who provided early feedback are longtime friends and mentors, many I barely knew when they agreed to read it. So thank you, Vicki Bean, Pamela Bookman, Molly Brady, Russell Angler, Rena O'Leary, Catherine Sabbath, Joe Singer, Jessica Steinberg, and many others. You all are my model for professional generosity and mentorship, and I aspire to pay it forward. Thank you again to the committee and AALS. It's a true honor to receive this award. Congratulations uh, to both honorees. And now, here's Erwin. Andrew, thank you again for chairing the committee, and my enormous congratulations to Nicole and to Jonathan with regard to their awards. Law school faculty, staff, and deans engaged throughout the year in 106 different ALS sections. The sections present the majority of programs here at the ALS conference. They provide mentorship for new faculty, and they facilitate discussions of important legal issues throughout the year. Sections are a way that faculty continue to support each other by providing advice, hosting webinars, 
providing comments on works in progress. You'll see the names of the section leaders in your program, and I'd like to take a moment for us all to give a round of applause to those who have led sections this year. <laughs> this year, to present the Section of the Year Award, please welcome the chair of the AAS Committee on Sections, Carol Needham from St. Louis University School of Law. Thank you, Dean Chemerinsky. The Section of the Year Award recognizes excellence in member support and other activities that promote AALS core values, including noteworthy annual meeting programming, facilitating outstanding scholarship, investing in mentoring programs and supporting excellent teaching, enhancing members' pro bono opportunities, engagement with the bar and bench, and creative use of technology to foster community and more. Since its inception, this award, the honor has been bestowed upon some of the Legal Academy's most dynamic communities, including AALS sections on alternative dispute resolution, associate deans for academic affairs and research, balance in legal education, clinical legal education, environmental law, legal writing, reasoning and research, pro bono and public service opportunities, property law, and women in legal education. Notice those are in alphabetical order. This year, the Committee on Sections is recognizing two AALS sections for outstanding service to their communities in the, and legal education. Note, this is not a first place with a runner-up. Both sections are on equal footing as co-winners of the 2023 Section of the Year Award. The first Section of the Year Award goes to the Section on Pre-Law Education and Admission to Law School. Here to accept the award is Matthew Kearns from Widener, Widener University Commonwealth Law School. No pressure, there's a lot of people here, huh? Thank you. It's an honor to accept this award on behalf of the section on pre-law education and admission to law school. I'd like to take a moment to recognize the section's officers and executive board who dedicated, dedicated their time and efforts to the se section's success. Please stand if you're here today. Sophia Sim, the George Washington University Law School. Anthony Irvin, University of the District of Columbia, David A. Clark School of Law. Christine Jackson, University of Colorado Law School. Preston Nicholson, Washburn University School of Law. Mimi Hung, Lewis and Clark Law School. Sean McShay, Boston College Law School. Patricia Kinney, Indiana University, Robert H. McKinney School of Law. Uh, and Becca Sadman Krauss, Penn State Dickinson Law. It has been inspiring to chair this team of dedicated professionals over the past year. Thank, for, thank you for your leadership and service to AALS. You are make, makes this organization a success. I also want to thank our section members, session presenters, and deans at our respective institutions for supporting and participating in our efforts throughout the year. Without you, we would not be here today. As I reflect on this year's conference theme, How Law Schools Can Make a Difference, I'm reminded of an editorial by Andrew Brennan, a defendant intervener in the Students for Fair Admissions versus the University of North Carolina. In his editorial, Mr. Brennan argues that colleges and universities serve as incubators for democracy. College teaches us how to disagree across lines of difference, which is a critical skill for our future leaders. However, we can only do so when we can cultivate the pluralistic, multicultural, and inclusive conditions on our campuses that are present in our larger society today. I think Mr. Brennan's sentiments ring even more true for law schools. As social constructs, laws are forged by those in power and reflective of their values. Our history has left us with an influence monolith that creates an illusion of a meritocracy, yet perpetuates the inequality and blind spots in our democratic processes that destabilize our society today. Looking around the room, we can see that the last half century, we have made progress. However, we are still only beginning to plant the seeds of change. 
it was only six years ago when women began entering law school at the same rate as men. This year, nationally, 39% of the entering class identified as persons of color, 14% identified as LGBTQ+, and 23% identified as first-generation college graduates. This may be the most diverse entering class in our history. However, the effect of these shifts will not be fully felt for generations. We must continue bringing, supporting, and empowering diverse viewpoints and experiences on our campuses. We must embrace uncomfortable conversations that challenge traditional power structures. These conversations don't increase division. They create opportunities to strengthen our democracy. And this brings us to the work in the section on pre-law education and admission to law school. AALS provides one of the only spaces to have candid conversations about how we recruit, admit, and retain students. We bring professors, administrators, students, and professionals together to discuss practical structural change and study the effects of our processes. As the gateway into the legal profession, the section's responsibility is to our future because today's law school candidates become the leaders of generations to come. I thank our section members for putting in the time, effort, and work to thoughtfully discuss and study how law schools can make a difference. And I thank AALS for its leadership and foresight in supporting legal education and the legal profession. Our work is often done quietly, so we are humbled that it is recognized loudly with the AALS Section of the Year Award. Thank you. So congratulations to the entire section. Our second Section of the Year Award is awarded to the Section on Technology, Law, and Legal Education. Here to accept the award on behalf of the section is April Dawson from North Carolina Central University School of Law. Come on up, April. Wow, there are a lot of people here. <laughs> um, so thank you. Um, let me just go ahead and go to my notes. So first, congratulations to the co-winners, the section on pre-law education and admission to law schools. We are delighted to be able to share this award with you. And of course, I'm happy to accept this award on behalf of the section on technology, law, and legal education. It goes without saying that this award recognizes the hard work of many. And I'd like to acknowledge the fabulous executive committee uh, we have Diane O'Leary. She is our chair-elect and incoming chair. Diane, if you could stand. And she is with Suffolk University Law School. And our secretary, Sonia Gibson-Rankin. Sonia, there we go. She is with the University of New Mexico School of Law. And we have three executive committee members, Alice Art Artemidge uh, with UC Hastings College of Law. Alice, are you here? Okay, well, we'll give her a round of applause anyway. Um, Susan uh, Nevelo Mart, who is with the University of Colorado School of Law, and she has actually retired from um, the Legal Academy, and she is off doing really exciting things. And Michael Roback, he is with the University of St. Thomas School of Law, and I know he is en route here to the um, annual meeting. I'd also like to thank the committee chairs and members. Um, if you are a member of one of the committees or committee chair, if you would please stand. If you're here today. Excellent, thank you very much. And I'd also like to say that this year's recognition is built on the work of visionary leadership and member efforts since the creation of this relatively new section, which was created in 2015. Um, if Michelle Pistone, are you here by chance? So I just want to give a special shout out and recognition to Michelle. It was because of her uh, leadership and her vision that this um, section was created. And every year we have just expanded and done more. And so thank you very much for um, making this all possible. And so last, I wanted to say a little bit about technology because this section continues to grow and continues to have an impact because technology continues to disrupt, influence, and impact the way that lawyers practice and what lawyers practice. 
Law schools need to more rapidly adjust law school curricula to ensure that law students are receiving the necessary legal tech training in the form of both law practice technology and technology law courses. The work of this section is vital, and this year the section continued to increase member engagement, provide teaching support to the entire academy, support technology-related legal scholarship, and lead and support efforts to improve legal education. Um, and so finally, I'd like to ask if there are any members of the section who have not yet stood up, if you would do so and be recognized. Thank you again, it's our honor to be recognized. Congratulations to everyone in the section. Sections also honor excellence in legal education in their individual fields. Today, we honor 47 outstanding individuals chosen by their peers in their AALS sections. We will not give an entire recounting of the scholarly output and work of each of the persons, uh, but if the honorees would please stand when your name appears on the screen, uh, if you are with us here today. Let's all um, enjoy the listing of the 2023 AALS Section Award winners. Section on Academic Support Impact Award, Jamie A. Klepich, DePaul University College of Law. Section on Academic Support Legacy and Leadership Award, Chris Franklin, New York Law School. Section on Administrative Law Emerging Scholar Award, Emily S. Bremer, Notre Dame Law School. Honorable Mention, Noah A. Rosenblum, New York University School of Law. Section on Aging and the Law Lifetime Achievement Award, Rebecca C. Morgan, Stetson University College of Law. Section on Animal Law Scholarship Teaching Service Award, Sherry F. Kolb, Cornell Law School. Section on Balance and Well-Being in Legal Education Annual Award, Heidi K. Brown, Brooklyn Law School. Section on Comparative Law Mark Tushnet Prize, Anna Conley. Alexander Blewett III School of Law at the University of Montana. Section on Criminal Law Junior Scholars Paper Competition, Sheldon Evans, St. John's University School of Law. Runners up, Alexis Hogue Forger, Brooklyn Law School, Catherine Miller, Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law, and Rosanna Summers, University of Michigan Law School. Section on Election Law Distinguished Scholarship Award. Tabitha Abuhej, Drexel University, Thomas R. Klein, School of Law. Bertral Ross, University of Virginia, School of Law. And Douglas M. Spencer, the University of Colorado Law School. Section on East Asian Law and Society, Jerome A. Cohen Award for Lifetime Achievement in East Asian Law and Society. John Haley, Washington University in St. Louis, School of Law. Section on Election Law, John Hart Ely Prize in the Law of Democracy. Pamela S. Carlin, Stanford Law School. Section on Evidence, John Henry Wigmore Award for Lifetime Achievement. Richard D. Friedman, University of Michigan Law School. Section on Family and Juvenile Law Achievement Award. Elizabeth Scott, Columbia Law School. Section on Federal Courts Best Untenured Article. Benjamin Johnson, the Pennsylvania State University, Penn State Law. Section on Global Engagement Outstanding Achievement Award. David Austin, California Western University School of Law. Section on Intellectual Property Award. Dimitri Karstedt, the George Washington University Law School. Section on International Human Rights Nelson Mandela Award. Gay McDougal, Fordham University School of Law. Section on Jurisprudence Hart Dworkin Award in Legal Philosophy. Shauna Schifrin, University of California, Los Angeles, School of Law. Section on Jurisprudence Article Award. Rebecca Stone, University of California, Los Angeles, School of Law. Section on Jurisprudence Future Promise Award. Aaron Miller, University of Southern California, Gould School of Law. And Nina Varseva, University of Wisconsin Law School. Section on Law and Religion Harold Berman Award for Excellence in Scholarship. 
Zalman Rothschild, University of Chicago, The Law School. Section on Law and Sports Award, Josephine R. Petuto, University of Nebraska, College of Law. Section on Law Libraries and Legal Information Award for Outstanding Service and Contributions to the Profession. Ann Kleinfelter, University of North Carolina, School of Law. Section on Law, Medicine and Healthcare Distinguished Health Law Service Award. Kathy Sermonera, Nova Southeastern Shepherd Broad College of Law. Section on Law Professors with Disabilities and Allies High Feldblum Award. Arlene S. Cantor, Syracuse University College of Law, and Catherine McFarlane, Southern University Law Center. Section on Legal Writing, Reasoning, and Research Award. Laura Graham, Wake Forest University School of Law. Section on Minority Groups Clyde Ferguson Award. Tamara F. Lawson, University of Washington School of Law. Section on Minority Groups Derek A. Bell Jr. Award. Daniel Scott Harawa, Washington University in St. Louis School of Law. Section on Part-Time Division Programs Part-Time Program Excellence Award. Liam Skilling, University of Hawaii William S. Richardson School of Law. Section on Pre-Law Education and Admission to Law School Excellence in Pre-Law Advising Award. Tina Coco, the University of New York Baruch College. Section on Pre-Law Education and Admission to Law School Organizational Changemaker Award. UndocuLaw Northwest. Section on Pre-Law Education and Admission to Law School Programmatic Changemaker Award. The Dillard Legal Education Advancing Diversity Program, Dillard University. Section on Pre-Law Education and Admission to Law School Presidential Changemaker Award. Becca Sabeman Krauss, the Pennsylvania State University Dickinson Law. Section on Pre-Law Education and Admission to Law School Up-and-Comer Award. Hannah Berman, the University of Alabama College of Arts and Sciences. Section on Pre-Law Education and Admission to Law School Unsung Hero Award. Alicia Miles, Alexander Blewett III School of Law at the University of Montana. Section on Pro Bono and Access to Justice, Access to Justice Award. Stephen Rispoli, Baylor University School of Law. Section on Pro Bono and Access to Justice Emerging Leader Award. Deborah Schlossberg, University of California, Berkeley School of Law. Section on Pro Bono and Access to Justice Lifetime Achievement Award. Russell Engler, New England Law, Boston. Section on Professional Responsibility Fred C. Zacharias Memorial Prize. Matthew Kim, Judicial Law Clerk on the Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit in Miami, Florida. Section on Remedies Lifetime Scholarly Achievement Award. Douglas Laycock, University of Virginia School of Law. Section on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Issues 2023 Individual LGBTQ Plus Inclusive Excellence Award. Arthur S. Leonard, New York Law School. Section on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Issues 2023 Institutional LGBTQ Plus Inclusive Excellence Award. Northeastern University School of Law. Section on Student Services, Peter N. Kudalakis Award. Elizabeth T. Bangs, the University of Texas School of Law. Section on Technology, Law, and Legal Education Award. Amy Schmitz, the Ohio University Michael E. Moritz College of Law. Section on Torts and Compensation Systems, William L. Prosser Award. John C. P. Goldberg, Harvard Law School. And Benjamin Zapersky, Fordham University School of Law. Section on Women in Legal Education, Ruth Bader Ginsburg Lifetime Achievement Award. Cynthia Nance, University of Arkansas School of Law. Carol, thank you for chairing the committee and congratulations to all of the section winners. We next recognize those who won Teacher of the Year awards in the past year. I have always believed that the most important thing we do as law professors is teach in the classroom. You'll find in your program a list of those who won Teacher of the Year awards. And if there are any who won a Teacher of the Year award in the past year or list in the program, if you could please rise and give a round of applause to all who won this important award. We have two additional awards to present that are bestowed by multiple sections. The first is the 2023 Deborah L. Rohde Award. I can't help but mention 
I met Deborah in 1968. We were competitor high school debaters in the Chicago area. <laughs> we became law professors at the same time, made friends over all those years, and somebody who I so tremendously admired. And to present the award this year, Professor Adrian Wang from the University of Iowa College of Law. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Dean Chemerinsky. Deborah Rohde had a tremendous impact on law and legal education. She was the Ernest W. McFarland Professor of Law and Director of the Center on the Legal Profession at Stanford Law School. Professor Rohde also served as President of AALS in 1998. She was founding president of the International Association of Legal Ethics in 2010. She was the author of 30 books in the areas of leadership, professional responsibility, gender law, and public policy, plus countless articles. She was very special to me <clears throat> as I was in her first class at Stanford Law School in 1979. She was fresh off of clerking at the Supreme Court for the late Justice Thurgood Marshall, and only the second female professor at Stanford. Needless to say, she did not look like the stereotypical paper chase Professor Kingsfield. By the end of the first class, it was clear she was a commanding intellectual powerhouse the end of the first class. <clears throat> Many years later, she was an inspiration for me as I began to teach sex-based discrimination using her textbook. And I also started writing <clears throat> in the areas of critical race feminism, the intersection of race and gender. And she was very supportive of my efforts over the many years. It has been a delight to be on the selection committee for the first two years of this award's existence. This year, the committee was chaired by BYU professor Elisa Dishman and included Richmond professor Tara Casey, Hofstra professor Ellen Yaroshevsky, and myself. This award is given annually to honor Professor Rohde's contributions, service, and leadership. The award is now presented by four sections in which she made a significant impact. The sections on leadership, pro bono and service opportunities, professional responsibility, and women in the legal profession. The award is bestowed upon a legal academic or lawyer who exemplifies the groundbreaking work, imagination, and inspired action of Deborah Rohde during her life and career. The selection committee received many compelling nominations in support of an array of legal educators who carry on Deborah Rohde's legacy. It is a tribute to her that there were many deserving nominees who do follow in her footsteps. This year, our selection committee was unanimous in honoring two individuals with this award. This year's first recipient is Professor Miriam Ahranjani from the University of Mexico, New Mexico School of Law. She is the Ronald and Susan Fredman Professor. She teaches and writes in the areas of constitutional law, criminal law and procedure, and education law. She's co-author of the textbook, Youth Justice in America. Professor Ahranjani currently serves as the reporter of the ABA Women in Criminal Justice Task Force. She's co-chair of the ABA Criminal Justice Section Women in Criminal Justice Committee and member of the ABA Standing Committee on Silver Gavel Awards. She has received recognition widely for her scholarship, teaching, and service. She's the current director of the Marshall Brennan Constitutional Literacy Project. She was named Albuquerque Woman of Influence in 2021. In 2020, she received the prestigious ABA Raider Toslitz Award. 
She was named in, in 2019-2020 University of New Mexico New Teacher of the Year. In 2019, she received the Stephen S. Goldberg Award for Distinguished Scholarship from the Educational Law Association. Prior to joining the law school faculty, she served as an international legal consultant in Guatemala City. Fluent in Spanish and Persian, she worked for the U.S. Department of State, U.S. Agency for International Development, and the ABA Rule of Law Initiative. She also previously taught and worked at American University, Washington School of College of Law, the University of Pennsylvania Law School, and several law schools in Latin America. I regret to tell you today that Professor Ahranchani could not be here in person, and you'll soon learn why, but she has sent her remarks. <clears throat> so I'm going to change. I don't know her personally, but I'm going to uh, try to give some voice to what she sent. Unfortunately, I cannot join you in person to accept this award because I just lost my father. An immigrant who came to the United States from Iran with nothing and built a sterling medical career, he would have been incredibly proud of me today. I am grieving, but still filled with deep gratitude for this recognition. I wish first to thank the members of the selection committee, Chair Elisa Dishman and Professors Tara Casey, Adrian Wing, and Ellen Yaroshevsky, and the AALS sections on leadership, pro bono and service opportunities, professional responsibility, and women in legal education. I also wish to thank the colleagues, collaborators, and friends who nominated me for this award, including Professors Sarah Redfeld and Carla LaRoche, Associate Dean John Kang, and King County, Washington, Senior Deputy Prosecuting Attorney, Albany Burns. I also thank Deborah Rohde, with whom I spare share a special connection for having graduated from the same suburban Chicago high school <laughs> <laughs> for paving and lighting the way for me and so many other women in the academy. Professor Rohde set a very high bar for excellence and perseverance in the iterative pursuit of justice. Perhaps Professor Rohde and I shared a sense that to whom much is given, much is expected. She serves as a lighthouse in my work as the reporter of the ABA Criminal Justice Section Women in Criminal Justice Task Force, which was created by the Criminal Justice Section under the leadership of Professor Lucien Dervan to expose and improve upon the pernicious and persistent challenges to gender equity in the criminal legal profession especially for women of color and women with other intersectional identities. Over a four-year period between 2019 and 2022, the task force and I conducted listening sessions all over the country, administrated online surveys, held focus groups with criminal justice leaders, wrote and spoke about our work in local and national venues, and created a roadmap for gender equity in the criminal legal profession based on all the feedback that we received. The ABA House of Delegates will soon vote on our resolution and report entitled 10 Principles for Gender Equity in the Criminal Legal Profession. After our principles become official ABA policy, the task force and I will work to promote and effectuate them. I will also continue my long-term efforts to shine a light on the egregious violations of children's constitutional rights in public schools and in the criminal legal system. Thank you for your support and for this humbling award. So congratulations to Professor Ahranchani. And while we are so sorry that you could not be here personally to hear these remarks, I am pleased that we could share these moving comments with everyone. Our second recipient of the Deborah L. Rohde Award is Jamelia N. Morgan. She is professor of law and director of the Center for Racial and Disability Justice at Northwestern Law School. 
She's an award-winning and acclaimed scholar and teacher, focusing on the issues of the intersections of race, gender, disability, and criminal law and punishment. Her scholarship and teaching examine the development of disability as a legal category in American law, disability and policing, overcriminalization, and the regulation of physical and social disorder, and the constitutional dimensions of the criminalization of status. Professor Morgan is chair of the AALS Disability Law Section, board member of Rights Behind Bars, board member of Disability Rights Bar Association, member of Legal Advocacy Committee, the ARC, board member of Connecticut Fair Housing Center, and board president of the Abolitionist Law Center. Prior to joining the faculty at Northwestern, she taught at UC Irvine School of Law and the University of Connecticut School of Law. She was a visiting professor and senior Lyman Fellow affiliate at Yale Law School, as well as a visiting assistant professor at Brooklyn Law School and an adjunct professor at NYU Law School. Prior to law school, she served as associate director of the African American Policy Forum, a social justice think tank that works to bridge the gap between scholarly research and public policy. Please join me in welcoming Professor Morgan. I'm incredibly humbled and honored to receive the Deborah L. Rohde Award, um, to receive this award in honor of such a towering legal scholar and teacher fills me with immense gratitude. I'd like to thank the nominating committee and the four ALS sections for this immense honor. Though I never met Professor Rohde like so many of us, I was impacted by her groundbreaking legal scholarship and advocacy. In fact, I was recalling recently that her 2010 article, The Injustice of Appearance, was actually the very first law review article that I ever read. Long before I knew about the intricacies of law, I was drawn to Professor Rohde's bold call to acknowledge and remedy forms of discrimination based on appearance. In this work, Rohde boldly criticized legal scholars and practitioners for their failures to address or take seriously this longstanding form of discrimination and to work to identify forms of redress, including what Rhodey identified as legal, policy, and cultural strategies to reduce the price of prejudice. In preparing these remarks, I reflected on my own work and how in many ways I've aspired to do what Rhodey did in this article and so many of her other groundbreaking works and advocacy. Through my scholarship and advocacy, I've sought to set, shed light on the plight and legal injuries suffered by multiply marginalized people with disabilities, including disabled people of color, queer disabled people, and low income disabled people. In particular, I've sought to surface the heightened forms of discrimination these groups have experienced within the criminal legal system as police subjects and as incarcerated subjects. This fall, I was honored to launch the Center for Racial and Disability Justice at Northwestern Pritzker School of Law. The mission of the center is to promote justice for people of color, people with disabilities, and individuals at the intersection of race and disability. I'd like to especially thank Dean Hari Asofsky for believing in the vision for this project and working tirelessly to see it through to fruition, as well as my colleagues and students at Northwestern for their encouragement and support. I would not be standing here if it were not for the tremendous support of so many. I'd like to thank my current and former colleagues at the University of Connecticut School of Law, UC Irvine School of Law, of course at Northwestern Pritzker School of Law, and also in practice at the Abolitionist Law Center, ACLU, and as a law student at the Lyman Center. And importantly, um, my uh, time at the African American Policy Forum, which was an organization, is an organization started by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, who has had an immense influence in my life and career. I'd also like to thank the community of scholars who have supported me throughout, including the Disability Law Section, the Decarceration Law Professors Group, and the Ludi A. Lytle Black Women Law Faculty Workshop. You all have challenged me and pushed me, helped me to strengthen my arguments, and provided countless hours of feedback and encouragement. A special thanks to two of the women that have supported me in this journey in legal 
uh, um, scholarship and in the academy, Ngozi Akedaba and India Tusi. Thank you all for your friendship and support. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I want to thank my family. My parents are here and my sister is here. I want to thank. <laughs> it means so much to see you all here. I want to thank you all for believing in me as I pursued this journey, even though I'm sure it wasn't clear to you where I was going. Your faith in me inspires me to do the best I can as a scholar and teacher and to advocate boldly for a just world. Thank you all so much. Congratulations, Miriam and Jamilia. You're so deserving the award, and we know you're going to very much build on the work and carry out the legacy of Deborah Rowdy. The final award that we have this afternoon, it's the first time we've given it. It's the Michael A. Olivas Award for Outstanding Leadership in Diversity and Mentoring in the Legal Academy. It's to honor the memory and legacy of former LLS president, University of Law Center professor Michael Olivas. It's especially to recognize his dedication in cultivating and mentoring minority and women faculty. Michael was an inspiration, a mentor, and a friend to so many of us. To present the award, I'd like to welcome to the stage Dean Anthony Verona from Seattle University School of Law. Thank you, Oren, very much, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm very honored today to award the very first Michael A. Olivas Award for Outstanding Leadership in Diversity and Mentoring in the Legal Academy. This new award serves as a memorial to Professor Michael A. Olivas, who passed away this past April after a distinguished career, a distinguished life, really, most recently as William B. Bates Distinguished Chair in Law Emeritus at the University of Houston and the director of the University of Houston's Institute for Higher Education Law and Governance. Professor Olivas was awarded the 2019 AALS Triennial Award for Lifetime Service to Legal Education and the Law, this association's highest honor. He was an elected member of the American Law Institute and the National Academy of Education. Professor Oliva served as president of AALS after serving on its executive committee and as interim president of the University of Houston downtown. He was a renowned scholar and teacher as well as an administrative leader, role model, cheerleader, advisor, mentor, hermano, tío y padrino, and community servant. What Professor Olivas is most remembered for is his legendary dedication to cultivating and mentoring minoritized LGBTQ and women faculty aspirants and junior faculty for his outspoken and effective leadership in diversifying the legal academy and profession for his peer mentoring and advocacy and championing by giving voice to the voiceless and speaking truth to power, all while achieving tremendous things in his teaching and his scholarship. Today, we are so grateful to have Michael's wife, University of Houston educator uh, and education professor, Tina Reyes, with us for the presentation of this award. Tina, would you please stand? Thank you. <clears throat> As we coped with the shock of Michael's unexpected passing, a number of us who cared greatly about Michael uh, came together to think of ways to honor his extraordinary legacy. I volunteered to reach out to Judy Arene, AALS's executive director, and she and the uh, AALS executive committee enthusiastically approved our proposal for an annual award named after Michael and in honor uh, and in his honor showcasing those extraordinary mentors and diversity champions who follow in his illustrious footsteps. 
The selection committee was comprised of Michael's dean, the great dean uh, Len Baines from Houston, and the chairs of five of the AALS sections that Michael held most dear and upon which he left the biggest impact. Those are the sections on civil rights, education law, immigration law, minority groups, and student services. So in addition to Dean Baines, the selection committee comprised of Natalie Gomez Vélez from CUNY, Marti Soc Gonzalez from uh, New Mexico, Emil Losa de Sils uh, from Hawaii, uh, Carolina Nunez from Brigham Young, and Maria Saistatman from uh, Tennessee. So I thank all of them, and it was an honor to serve as their chair. The selection committee for the Olivas Award, as you would expect, received many, many compelling, beautiful uh, nominations in support of an array of legal education leaders who very effectively carry on so much of Michael's legacy. We hope that many of those uh, nominees will be renominated next year and the year after and the year after that because they are so deserving of this award. But this year, in the inaugural year of the Olivas, the WLS Olivas Award, the selection committee was unanimous in our agreement with his very many and very enthusiastic and very insistent uh, and eloquent nominators that there is no one more deserving of the first Olivas Award than Dean Kevin Johnson. For decades, Dean Kevin Johnson has exemplified Michael Olivas' dedication to uplifting the next generation of diverse leaders in legal education. Kevin's biography is long and illustrious, beyond impressive, and widely available online. <laughs> what is most important about Kevin and not in that bio is what I'm going to focus on. He is an extraordinary mentor, a trusted advisor, a courageous champion, a bold leader, a fierce advocate for diversity in and access to the legal academy, to legal education, to the legal profession, and in law itself. Kevin is a brilliant scholar, a gifted teacher, one of the longest serving deans among us, the first Latino to serve as dean in the UC system. He is a devoted friend, a community and professional servant of the first class, and an extraordinary role model who puts himself on the firing line again and again for the cause of diversity, equity, access, and fairness. Doesn't that all sound so very familiar? Like Michael, Kevin is a luminary for so many of us who follow in his footsteps. I know that Michael himself would have cheered this selection. It is my honor to present the inaugural Olivas Award to UC Davis School of Law Dean, Kevin Johnson. Thank you, Tony, and thank you all for being here. It's a, a true honor. Uh, I want to especially thank Tina Reyes, Dr. Tina Reyes, for being here. Um, I can't tell you how honored I feel today. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about what, what I could say that would be um, um, what Michael would want me to say. Uh, and the thing that just came to mind as I was thinking where we were along the border is Michael would say that we should all recognize that within 20 miles of where we stand, there's a border wall that separates two nations that results in regular deaths of people of color on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. 
That said, I, I have to say that this entire annual meeting has felt like a very surreal meeting for me, a very surreal movie. It's an ALS meeting, my first ever with, with no Michael Olivas. It's my first ALS meeting ever with no advice, sometimes unsolicited, <laughs> and guidance, talking me off the ledge, comparing notes, and just being my friend with Michael Olivas. This is the first annual meeting where I don't get the wit and wisdom of Michael Olivas, often directed at me. Uh, this is the first Latino law professor's dinner that I attended uh, without Michael Olivas. And I have to say, to, if I admit it, truth, is I, when I went in, sort of the sadness fell over me and I almost just left because I was sad that Michael wasn't sitting there uh, to greet us. There's no annual coffee or meal with Michael Olivas. Um, there's no time for him to ask specifically about how Tomas, Teresa, and Elena were doing, as well as Virginia, who he always referred to as the brains of the household. <laughs> I can't really go into detail here about how important Michael has been to so many people in terms of his scholarship, in terms of his community building, in terms of his activism, um, and how special he was in so many ways. So for me, this award means such a great deal um, because I truly believe that I would not have had any of the opportunities I had without the support, the vision, and without Michael Levis as a role model. He's a person who called our chancellor, recommended me for the deanship at UC Davis, he wrote a tenure letter for me. He massively edited an article um, that needed massive editing um, <laughs> uh, and uh, helped make it serviceable, but tenurable. Um, I want to thank so many people. Um, um, uh, uh, one of the people I want to thank is uh, the late Dean Rex Pershbacher of UC Davis School of Law, who chaired my tenure committee. Uh, and asked me to be associate dean and then help, help me as I became dean. I thank all my colleagues at UC Davis because they're uh, amazing and make my job so easy. I think the school could operate without any dean and uh, I might suggest that at some point as being a good idea. Um, uh, I wanna thank the, the, uh, the nominators. Uh, I, I don't know who all of them were and um, I, I don't say all of them to make it sound grandiose in some ways, but. Tony suggested there's, there, was, there, was, there were many. Uh, but I do know that Raquel Aldana, Rose Villazor, and Angela Nwachi Willig put in a great deal of time and effort in the process, and now I hope they can get on to more productive activities. Um, um, I, I uh, um, want to thank the committee uh, for this honor. Uh, I want to thank, even though he's not here, Michael Olivas, who I think of as my guardian angel in so many ways. And as I thank before, I'd like to thank Tina for everything she's done. And finally, I want to thank my family, um, my children, my wife, Virginia, who couldn't be here because um, she works for hospice, and uh, this is a busy time of year, sadly. Um, and um, 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 that family um, um, always believed in me when I wasn't so sure that I believed in myself. So I appreciate all of them and all their help. And thank you all. This is a real honor that I'll cherish. Congratulations, Kevin, on this so well-deserved honor. Before we adjourn, I'd like to take a moment for all of us to express appreciation to the LLS staff who put this program and all of the conference together. <laughs> this then concludes the 2023 awards ceremony. Congratulations to all who were honored 
Thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of the conference.